Hello, everyone. We are going to start our seventh keynote, a very special one under the theme of the world from above, an astronaut perspective that is delivered by Dr. Reinhold Eval, a former ESA astronaut. Today, we are witnesses, and maybe some of us will be uh, soon actors in a close future of a very uh, historic moment in the European space sector. After uh, 12 years, ESA has opened a new call for astronaut applicants. For many space enthusiasts, the possibility of becoming an astronaut has been the driving motivation for all their uh, choices on educational and professional frames, and the possibility of being an astronaut would be a dream come true. Our next speaker, Dr. Reinhold Eval, is a source of motivation and inspiration for, for all of us. The challenge he faced and overcame, his determination and his uh, contribution that he made during the space mission where he allowed us to better understand the space and his impact on life are a very um, remarkable achievement for all of us. Thus, in this event, the European Space Generation Workshop under the theme of Space for Earth and Humanity, his testimony and, and advice are essential for the delegates. So, Dr. Reinhold Eval, welcome today with us. Hello and uh, good morning to everyone on Hello. the screens. Good morning. Thank you again for giving this keynote to our delegates and I will give the floor to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pilar, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, address you on this uh, Saturday morning on something that uh, kind of takes up what you have been discussing half an hour ago in the panel, which is uh, a view, a view out of uh, this uh, world and a view back on our world. And um, as uh, Pilar already said, it's a privilege of the astronauts to have this perspective, to be in the middle between looking up from the Earth's surface uh, and uh, looking from the vast uh, uh, of the universe down on Earth. So I called my lecture today, The World from Above, an astronaut's perspective. And we really know that we are very privileged to have this uh, perspective, something that humanity has been dreaming of uh, for, for ages and centuries, uh, and we are living in a time where this is possible, where we have all the facts, where we have all these uh, insights into what is happening around us uh, in, in the universe. Because we, uh, we mentioned it, um, this uh, lecture and also the uh, workshop is supported by the so-called ISS Crew Fund, and the ISS Crew Fund, you find a little uh, uh, information here was founded in 2014. Uh, that was the time when the Westphalian Peace Prize, a uh, renowned uh, German prize, remembering the end of the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century, uh, was uh, given to the crews of the International Space Station for their peaceful cooperation in times where East and West probably are not on, on best speaking terms. Uh, this uh, cooperation keeps on, as we know, uh, there are colleagues flying now around the Earth uh, now on the ISS, uh, working together in a, in a very concentrated and peaceful fashion. And uh, you see representatives of uh, the ISS crews. You see Thomas Reiter here flying for ESA and uh, uh, Michael Lopez Alegria, very experienced astronaut from NASA. And you see Pavel Vinogradov. Uh, and they are presenting the Westphalian horse, which was the symbol of this uh, um, prize, but also money dedicated uh, to the prize winners. And uh, the ISS crews uh, founded a fund from where uh, these uh, kind of workshops that you see today are supported. At all times, uh, people have looked up in the sky and wondered about the um, wonders that they could see. They could not make a lot of sense out of these moving lights and uh, the changes that they see, but also fixed uh, stars that, that uh, would come up in the night. Uh, people have been probably more intense uh, regarding the night skies in, in former times when the light pollution was not uh, um, everywhere, 
And uh, so this is a very, very early 4,000 before Christ uh, testimony of that people always wondered what is out there and uh, how the surrounding of the earth uh, would, would look like. And you see the, the symbols of sun and moon, you see stars, and even now people are uh, looking deeper into this, um, um, into this uh, artifact. They um, still discover things that have been hidden in this uh, very early testimony of uh, stargazing that we uh, don't don't know of yet. And so it's a very active piece of astronomy, of ancient astronomy, uh, and a proof that people at all times wondered about the world out there and uh, what it's uh, looking like. There's another thing, not. Uh, looking up, but uh, rather sending things up uh, into the vastness of uh, space. And this is uh, a, a representation of the golden record, of the cover of one of the golden records that went out with the Voyager probes. The Voyagers in the 70s uh, of the last century took the opportunity to visit the major big planets and uh, do a grand tour of uh, the planetary system, a unique constellation that doesn't come up uh, uh, too often. We have to wait probably uh, centuries in order to uh, be able to do this uh, grand tour. And luckily, a space flight at the time uh, in the 70s was uh, far advanced enough uh, to risk this uh, grand tour. And uh, because uh, it was clear that these uh, Voyager probes would not return to Earth, uh, Carl Sagan and the team around him, the famous astronomer, he um, proposed that we send a message into space, that we identify ourselves and uh, this uh, hieroglyphs that you see on the record for an intelligent species uh, give a clue on where we are, what we are, how we look like, and even they played at that time record was the, the top of the, uh, uh, the recording media. Uh, they played uh, sounds uh, and greetings from Earth on, on these records. So, um, looking out, sending out, this has been always something that spaceflight was connected to. Um, the scientific uh, look into the sky started rather slow. It was uh, taken as a, as a given, uh, and people didn't wonder in a scientific way about it. And so, I have a representation of a painting that is showing the flight of the, um, the Holy Family from Jerusalem to uh, Egypt uh, by Adam Elsheimer, and he painted it in the 17th century, beginning of the 17th century, 1609. And this is the first time that the stars are really represented, not only as um, chance uh, dots, but rather as uh, something that obviously the painter had observed. And also the moon is not just a, a, a bright dot, but it has features that we also see with the naked eye from our world. And because we talked of Hera in the last uh, session and the mission to the uh, asteroid, this is another uh, mythology, uh, mythology about Hera. Hera uh, wakes up when Heracles, the little boy here, uh, tries to um, uh, drink the milk from uh, Hera's breasts and uh, she spills the milk and that gives uh, birth to the um, Milky Way that is uh, correctly called so at least in Greek uh, mythology and you see Zeus uh, not being amused about all that and uh, this is from Peter Paul Rubens and it's also in the 17th century that uh, these kind of things were um, were coming up in the minds of uh, the people trying to depict it. Uh, this is something that uh, knowledge is good for. It uh, keeps you from fearing things that you don't know of. So the world in, in ancient uh, depiction was full of monsters and uh, unknown dangers and uh, things that you better keep away from as long as people did not go beyond the pillars of uh, Heracles, for example, the Straits of Gibraltar, to uh, detect new continents, um, they feared that they would be eaten up by monsters and that uh, the world around them was in a, in a way hostile. And science actually, and looking out and um, researching things keeps you from uh, having fears. Uh, it replaces fear by knowledge, which is, uh, a nice representation in this map. 
And so uh, astronauts at all times have uh, not only looked uh, out into the night sky uh, above the uh, Earth's atmosphere, seeing things like the Milky Way in a very bright and very colorful uh, spectacle, but they have also looked down on Earth. Um, as you know, the ISS, the International Space Station, and its predecessor uh, stations have not been far out of the, uh, Earth. It's uh, rather 400 kilometers. So you always have a contact to Earth. You always see parts of the Earth, uh, like in this excellent uh, view at nighttime uh, into the sky. And you see the very, very thin band of the atmosphere here that the astronauts always talk about. Yes, Earth is a big planet uh, compared to our moon or other objects in the sky, but uh, it's limited. It's uh, something that, that you can grab with your senses. It's not uh, overwhelmingly large, uh, but something that uh, astronauts keep always in view and in mind when they circle the Earth in 90 minutes. You know that one of the orbits of the International Space Station takes 90 minutes. You see beautiful sites and uh, continents and uh, oceans uh, keep floating by. Within 90 minutes, you are back uh, at least at uh, the equator or wherever you cross. And um, uh, a little bit to the west, 2,000 kilometers to the west. And within 16 orbits, you see most of the inhabited Earth. The ISS flies at a 51 degree inclination. And so most of the Earth is in, in view for you. Um, but the real surprise came when people started uh, flying out to the moon. And that was in the, in the late uh, 60s, as you know. Uh, these uh, Apollo astronauts were not at all uh, prepared for what they would be seeing. And so this is an iconic photo of Earth rise above the moon horizon taken by the crew of Apollo 8. And they even had religious feelings about what they were seeing, the creation in work, uh, the Earth suspended in the blackness of, uh, of space and this barren moon as a contrast to the, to the blue Earth. Very, very impressive and uh, it left its impression on the astronauts' images. And when we go out, uh, not uh, with human spaceflight, but rather with robotics, we see strange objects indeed. This is uh, Shuryumov Gerasimenko, the comet that the Rosetta probe visited a couple of years ago. Uh, we see the activity of a, a comet uh, developing. Rosetta accompanied this uh, object uh, throughout the active phase around the sun and even deployed a lander, the Philae lander, on the uh, Rosetta, uh, on the uh, comet uh, to do further research. And with our telescope, we see strange wonders indeed. And we use all um, all parts of the spectrum, from the far infrared to the visible to X-rays, uh, with uh, the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, a collection of best of of the Hubble Space uh, Telescope you see here, and um, we hope that uh, this kind of uh, possibility to look out in the university with intelligent eyes, with eyes that can uh, distinguish features in different uh, spectral classes, that this keeps on, and you know that uh, James Webb's uh, space telescope is preparation and uh, hopefully will be launched soon to uh, help with uh, the Hubble observations and later on when Hubble uh, really has to cease its duty uh, to uh, replace it. But uh, looks into the sky also offers surprises uh, that you don't uh, think of and uh, that you cannot make science of but rather feel emotionally. And one of these uh, images is shown here. It's the uh, look back from one of the Voyager probes uh, before leaving the solar system into the solar system. It's an enlargement of this photograph. And in this enlargement, you see stripes of dust in the inner uh, planetary system of our solar system. And you see a little, little, little small blue dot here, which can be a pixel error, except that uh, the cameras on Voyager do not have pixels. They were not of that generation, but of an earlier one. And this must be a real object. And Carl Sagan identified it as uh, planet Earth. Planet Earth, from a perspective at the, at the edge of the solar system, is one blue dot, one small pixel uh, in, in a camera 
view. And this is all where we live on. That is all where our hopes and dreams and uh, our workshops and intelligent and funny things are happening. So a very impressive image uh, when you look down on the world. And um, Alexander Gast, the ESA astronaut that uh, came to his, his first flight in 2014, took up this motif of the blue dot. The blue dot that we have to preserve when we fly into space, we also do research in order to better keep our uh, planet in a good shape and uh, worthwhile for a uh, human being. But we also go out to Mars. We, uh, we are aware of the wonders of the universe. This was the symbol of his mission. And indeed, I mean, he had a good opportunity to look down on Earth in this marvelous object, uh, which is the International Space Station. The International Space Station uh, started out in 1998 with the very two first elements here, a Russian and an American element, and ever since has grown to a um, size of 450 tons of material in space. This is the largest, let's say, uh, extension of the complex that uh, we could show because it still has the American space shuttle attached. It shows that this image is, well, 2011 or so. Uh, taken from uh, a Soyuz spacecraft that was leaving the International Space Station. And we have um, European vehicles, uh, the ATV here, we have the uh, Soyuz and uh, Progress spacecraft. Um, and uh, this shows what the nature of this uh, International Space Station is. It's, it's resting on the shoulders of a lot of partners, the Russians, the, the Americans, Canadians, the Europeans and Japanese join their forces in order to create this platform in space. And from there, you have all these marvelous views that you see on Instagram or in Facebook. All the astronauts are now present on social media, something that I didn't have uh, the opportunity in uh, when I was on, on board of the uh, Mir station back in 1997. And beautiful photos indeed, beautiful images. Uh, looking down on Earth, you see mostly uh, water and uh, you see clouds and it can be to a point that the, the back radiation, the scattered radiation from the clouds, especially the UV is really itching in your eyes. You should be careful. This is the atmosphere, 80 kilometers of atmosphere. We are in a 400 kilometer orbit. We look down on the atmosphere. Yes, it's large. Yes, it's huge, but it's not unlimited. And this is the message that all the astronauts tell. Uh, that come back from space. Uh, we, we have seen the Earth as a global one. And uh, we should be taking care of what we do on one side of the Earth, not to affect the other side. Going out uh, of the space station, as Alexander had the chance, is uh, the ultimate experience of looking down on, on Earth, being alone in uh, the universe, especially when you, uh, as, as was the case, are uh, riding the um, extended uh, robotic arm of the International Space Station. So you're the last individual between Earth and Moon, literally. And there's nothing around you except for the helmet of your spacecraft, uh, of your of your spacesuit that uh, uh, keeps you uh, uh, healthy. Um, and uh, you look down into the vastness of the universe. This is an impressive moment I really envy all the astronauts that had the chance to do EVA at uh, my flight, there was no possibility. And this is something where you have not only a scientific, but also an emotional impact. When you look down, uh, look out of the space station into uh, the um, starry sky, you see more stars. You see them more clearly, but they are still pinpoints. It's not that you have a better so resolution of what they actually are, suns and galaxies. But you see more, and it's like velvet. It's it's like looking into a velvet surface where all these little points are uh, sticking out. So you are literally drawn into this image when you look out on the universe. The blackness is so intense that you try to see structure in it, uh, like in velvet. And I found one representation of that, and that was from a painter, Yves Klein, a French. A uh, painter that says, I'm the painter of space. Let's be honest, in order to paint space, I pass, put myself on the spot in space itself. And it's true. If you approach his images, looking at the, the guards in the museum, whether they allow it, and if you approach his images, he has invented an international Klein Bleu, as he calls it. It's an ultramarine pigment 
um, that is very intense and draws you just like space and the blackness of space draws you into the painting. This image of Yves Klein is a good representation. Leaving the shutter open uh, is an impressive sight that gives you all the dynamics of the movement of the International Space Station. You hardly notice the movement because you do not have something to compare your movement to. The next fixed object are the clouds of the higher atmosphere, but they are far away. And so movement is very smooth. But if you leave the shutter of your camera open for a full revolution, you have pictures like this. And uh, there is a guy also, Thomas Ruff, uh, on Earth who uses it for art, for pieces of art. In this image, you will see streaks of space debris of uh, spent rocket um, um, stages or uh, other debris streaking through this uh, starry field. Um, it's a real mess for astronomers if this happens, but uh, Thomas Ruff uh, uses it uh, in, in his art. And we have, uh, let's say, more popular representations of uh, debris uh, threatening spaceflight. You probably remember the gravity movie with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney is as uh, unfactual and unscientific as Armageddon was for uh, fending, defending against an asteroid. Uh, but it was not the, the main purpose of the movie. It was to, to show the humans helplessness, almost helplessness in uh, the, the dangers of the universe and the rebirth of humankind after all these dangers. So a lot of science and a lot of uh, emotion and a lot of art depicting this. This is not a piece of art. This is something that the Earth does in terms of art. It's a small island called Guadeloupe. It's not the one that you probably think of, but it's in the, uh, before the Bay of California. And you see the wind patterns, uh, a typical wind pattern uh, that uh, is influenced by this island. And it's almost a piece of art that you could sell in a museum and say, uh, I in invented it. So looking down from uh, skies uh, is full of wonder. I cannot help but to show you my uh, hometown here, uh, Cologne, uh, in a marvelous perspective from space. Uh, they, they really, the astronauts on board of the International Space Station now master digital photography. You see the ships crossing underneath the bridges. You even see the, the Cologne Cathedral here. Uh, as, as a kind of cross uh, straight from above and impressive views. And everyone looks first day to their hometowns, to their home country. Second day, you see the continent. Oh, Europe. Oh, how nice. And now we are crossing across Europe. The third day, probably they only see the full, full Earth because all the Earth is of wonder and all the continents are different and all the uh, uh, things to see come come up in this 90-minute uh, orbit. And this is the message that the astronauts give. The Earth is a global one. And um, you can have all this information by the eyes of satellite, but it probably takes a human to bring this message over. The most beautiful uh, scenery that you can see are the northern lights. And uh, I tell you, the, the only quiet moments we had away from work uh, was when we were crossing through the southern or northern uh, uh, lights and this, uh, seeing this uh, curtains of uh, color uh, from the um, dangerous radiation parts uh, particles streaming onto Earth. This is uh, the highlight, let's say, of the views from above uh, that I can bring to you uh, this morning. I tell you, this will always be a site, uh, uh, a site activity of the astronauts to look out of the window. They are very busy and. Normally, you will spend your days uh, within a module that has no windows, but going to the windows is full of wonders, either looking down on Earth or looking up in the sky. And uh, thank you for your, in, uh, for your attention. I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ranho, for this inspiring keynote. It, it has been very thrilling for all of us. Uh, thank you for sharing these experiences that are unknown for us, but uh, that really drive all our dreams. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that all delegates really enjoyed your keynote. I can tell from the amount of questions. So yes, let's take the time to share the, the doubts and the question for you and answer all of them. So I will start from the more rated one. I have one that says, what is your view on the commercialization of space and the side effects that come with it, degrees, pol uh, political tensions and militarization? 
Uh, there are two aspects to the uh, um, to the question. One is that uh, obviously it's fun to go out in space. Uh, the fun is a little bit uh, tempered by the um, long training that you have to do in order to do scientific work. So the usual average training time for international space station astronauts is something like two, two and a half years, in addition to being selected as an astronaut and having received a basic training. So the professionals think of it uh, um, that the commercialization, we can't help it. We, we I think uh, everyone deserves this beautiful view from, from space. And if you can afford it, in the moment it's rather costly. And so the selection of people uh, being able to buy themselves a flight will be rather on the, on the richer side of the uh, of the spectrum. But these people will probably tell the same story as we do. They think they come up in order to tell later at the party, I have been in space and, and rather look cool, but they will be surprised uh, how, how, how gripping this experience will be for them. And so they join the ranks of the uh, astronauts, uh, some 500 something, individuals that have been up and uh, coming down, most of them tell the same views, tell the same impression. The other is uh, that we keep on working uh, in a, in a um, cooperative matter, uh, manner, uh, independent of politics. And the politics has ever since the inset of uh, International Space Station in 1998 had, had its up and downs. Uh, in the moment, it's rather on the downside, let's say, between east and west, but uh, this doesn't affect the work on, on board of the space station. So, indeed, it's a good role model that we continue, that we go on, despite political differences, with this uh, international endeavor. Thank you very much. Hopefully, we will get more aware of the delicate equilibrium of our earth and beautiful and people get more engaged on, on keeping sustainability uh, sustainable, sustainable uh, life on, on it. So let me introduce you another question. Uh, for the delegates that are not eligible for the ESA astronaut call of 2021, when do you expect a new astronaut call in the future? Uh, eligible in terms of not having the necessary prof professional experience. Well, um, I take the word from the ESA managers that they now want to uh, shorten the time between um, selection rounds. Uh, last selection was 2009. That is certainly too long, but uh, things had to settle down and, and become into a routine mode. Uh, what is the good news is the flight opportunities uh, are becoming more and more. So we have the commercial uh, spacecraft offering seats. We have probably uh, corporations in the future that we don't know of. And we have a couple of objects to go to, like the, the uh, gateway station around the moon. Uh, so I, I expect that it will be much earlier than in the last, uh, let's say, in the next four to six years, we will have another selection. But there are way, other ways. Uh, then only through ESA or NASA or uh, JAXA, you, you, if we had the concept of the payload specialist, so people very experienced in one experiment, and they were flying on the shuttle with one flight because their companies or their um, the, the agencies that uh, were interested in this flight paid for them. There are quicker ways than entering the astronaut career. Both ways are feasible and uh, advisable. Thank you very much. So a question linked to this one is, what are your words of wisdom for future and upcoming astronauts? <laughs> Have a plan B. I mean, flying into space is still a very rare exception on, on uh, your lifetime career. You are interested into science in STEM fields. You, you engage yourself. That is the best thing you, uh, you can do. And if it happens, like in my lucky case back in 86, I mean, that uh, you are part of an astronaut selection, really make it into the uh, last uh, uh, round. That is uh, a lifetime experience, but you will certainly, with your engagement and your interest, have also in the Plan B a very exciting experiences. Okay. Thank you. So as for everything in life, second plan is always important. Yes, so cool. we have another question. Does an astronaut ever feel prepared before a new launch? What is the feeling before and after crossing the atmosphere? Well, the, um, the training is excellent, and we have seen that in uh, throughout the years. Uh, for, for my training for the mirror station, it was all located in Star City. Nowadays, it's uh, very international, and so you have to 
uh, kind of standardize it so that uh, things uh, and methods are not different in Japan from what they do in, in Europe. But uh, so that is the feeling that you have when you approach the rocket, that you're well prepared, that this is the day where you can show everything that you have been trained on and uh, that, that probably uh, adds to scientific insights and uh, you are prepared to go. You don't think of the risk anymore. The risk is something that you have to make probably uh, account on uh, when, when you apply you become an astronaut because obviously the only way into space is riding a rocket. So, um, but the risk is something that uh, is contained. We, we see how safe these vehicles are. And even now the commercial vehicles have to do a lot of uh, precursor flights in order to show the level of safety before actually people sit into them. Okay, great, thank you. So after the application is something that disappears during the training already. You keep focus on, on the goal, final goal. It, it's a fair deal. So the, the people that uh, construct the rocket will show you what are the risks and uh, you have to make up your mind whether you this is worth the risk. And I was fully convinced that sitting in the Soyuz rocket on that very launch day, uh, the risk of uh, not being able to perform what I have been trained on was worse uh, because the results uh, that we brought home were convincing. Thank you very much. So a question more in the future. With the ISS decommission date stated for 2024, 2028 or perhaps even later, what kind of future do you see in terms of global space collaboration, a new station, Artemis, Mars or anything else? That uh, depends on the point of view. For people that cannot expect to go to Mars, I mean, uh, everything in, in Earth orbit probably is, is uh, a loss of time. Uh, for people that want to do science, um, the uh, presence of a research place in low Earth orbit, as we call it, is something that is the easiest to reach and the easiest to uh, accomplish. So there will be always a compromise. Uh, what I see is that uh, the, the number of entities being interested in putting something of that kind in human spaceflight into space is uh, rising. So we see companies that actually think of attaching modules to the International Space Station and once the International Space Station is not uh, supported anymore by the, um, by the agencies that do it in the moment, detach these modules and fly it as a single uh, unit. We see also um, a, a lot of attention and a lot of participation for the gateway, which is harder to reach and probably not a good place uh, to place your your microgravity uh, science on. So I, I see a mixture and I think the end of ISS will certainly not be 24, will certainly also not be 28 with all these ideas probably will be lasting well into the uh, 30s, given that it's not hit by that then. Um, <laughs> Asteroids. <laughs> we will make our panelists work on it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we have a question uh, related with the message you passed uh, through your keynote, through your presentation. Do you think that beside the technical aspect of the job, the most important role of an astronaut is to act as an advocate for protecting planet Earth and fighting climate change? I can only underwrite this. Um, I, I mean, that puts you in the, in the direction of being becoming green huh? and, and, and only acting as a green person. No, it's it's uh, something that you can can uh, authentically uh, describe when you have circled the Earth. That uh, what you what what you do on one side of the Earth has an effect on the other. We see these large ocean streams. The the um, we see cloud patterns that stretch over an ocean. We see continent-wide um, Sahara sand from the Sahara blown over the whole continent. So we see these things and we describe them. And uh, uh, this is more convincing for me, listening to a human being, than uh, all the satellite data that you need to corroborate and to plan uh, uh, actions to conserve Earth. This is very important to have all the data. But uh, to put the first step into movement uh, is something that astronauts, cosmonauts, taikonauts uh, uh, of all this world do. Thank you very much. So we have the time for a last question that I picked up for its originality. So thank you to Christina. And I picked this up because it's very linked to your presentation, very artistic one. So art is widely used to communicate the space. 
but how do you feel about the considerable lack of art in today's space education? Of art? Mm -hmm. ART. Yes, uh, it, it's regrettable that uh, the time has not come to um, send more people of non uh, uh, STEM background, let's say, into space. Uh, and with the advent of, of commercialization, um, this will be possible. Uh, there have been uh, attempts uh, to bring art into earlier space stations, like the Mir uh, space station from an Austrian uh, artist. Uh, my uh, dear friend uh, Shiaki Mukai, the Japanese uh, uh, lady flyer, she has uh, written poems and, um, and exchanged uh, poetic um, glances with the audience uh, on, on the ground. So there have been attempts, but uh, for the moment it's, it's rather technical, it's scientific, and uh, not a lot of time uh, dedicated to these thoughts. And probably it will come, and hopefully it will come, especially as it adds a new argument to flying into space. Okay. Thank you very much, Reinhold. It has been a You're pleasure welcome. for all of us to have you here and to listen all your advice and experiences. Thank you again, and I hope you enjoyed also the time with us. Yes, I certainly did, and uh, uh, I wish you a very successful workshop, and uh, probably the next year then there will be chances also to meet in person and uh, to chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, face to face. For sure, we are looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. All the best. Bye bye. Bye bye.